University, along with being a visiting professor at the University of Queensland and the University of Paris. Uh, Peter is now a professor in the EECS and Statistics Department at the University of California, Berkeley. And more recently, he is taking up a position as an associate director uh, at the Simons Institute for the, theory, uh, for the Theory of Computing, which has been hosting numerous thoughtful and timely uh, semester-long programs. So Peter's just made numerous fundamental research contributions to machine learning and statistical learning theory, uh, where he's just received a number of awards, including being elected to the Australian Academy of Sciences. On a more personal note, uh, it is an honor for me to introduce Peter. Uh, I met Peter in grad school, and even though I was never a student or postdoc with him, he always felt like a mentor to me, and my discussions with him have deeply impacted my own trajectory, as I'm sure it did uh, with, many, uh, with many others. Uh, his, his work has just touched in fundamental ways many areas of machine learning, uh, for example, his work in the 90s, uh, he co-authored a book with Martin Anthony, uh, Neural, Network, uh, Neural Network Learning Theoretical Foundations. So uh, it's really great for the community that Peter circled back to uh, looking at deep learning, and he's going to be telling, about, uh, telling us about some of his results today, where he's uh, giving us fresh insights to uh, generalization in these models, uh, along with insights that come from understanding uh, simpler models uh, to get at deep learning. So let's turn it over to Peter for the talk. All right, well, first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'm very grateful for this honor. Uh, my talk today is about the surprising phenomenon of benign overfitting that we see in deep learning. Um, but I'd like to start with a broader story uh, about theoretical progress inspired by large scale machine learning problems. So it's about questions of generalization, information theoretic questions, very appropriate for a lecture in honor of Ed Posner. Uh, and it's a story that stretches over three decades of NeurIPS. I'll touch on some generalization theory from the late 1980s. Um, and then look at overparameterization, uh, the observation that neural nets with more parameters than the sample size can generalize well. People were surprised at that 25 years ago. Um, we'll review some work from that time illustrating uh, perhaps why we shouldn't be surprised by it. And then most of the talk is about the more recent uh, related phenomenon of benign overfitting. So let's go back to volume one of advances in neural information processing systems. Um, that was 1998, uh, 1988, and Eric Bauman and David Hausler were interested in this question of generalization in neural nets. When does good performance on a training sample uh, imply good predictive accuracy? So I was excited about this paper when I saw it a few years later. Um, the, the way they formulated this problem was probabilistic. Uh, so we have a sample of size n, n x, y pairs, x1, y1 through x, n, y, n. And the aim is to choose some function that maps from the x space to the y space so that f of x is a good prediction of y in the sense that some loss is small. The loss of predicting f of x when the outcome is y uh, should be small. So we make probabilistic assumptions here. For instance, in pat pattern classification, you know, we might have um, uh, just the loss is just the indicator of making a mistake. So we're interested in, in uh, having that small. Under probabilistic assumptions, we assume that these x, y pairs are chosen identically uh, uh, from some, some uh, particular distribution. Um, uh, an unknown distribution, and, and the aim in that case is having small risk. So the expected loss for the pattern classification problem, misclassification probability, uh, should be small. So that's what we're shooting for in this choice of a function. Uh, and of course, you know, we're going to try to do that by optimizing some statistic on the data, and a, a, a reasonable choice is to minimize the empirical risk, so the sample average of the loss, uh, perhaps over some function class capital F. That might be the class of functions that a neural net of a certain certain size can compute, for instance. Um, and just to highlight some notation that I'll be using throughout, um, L sub F is the loss that the function F incurs. We want its expectation to be small. And this E hat denotes 
the expectation under the empirical distribution, so the sample average of, of a quantity, in this case, the, the loss. Okay, so uh, very famous result for the classification setting. If we have a class of, of binary valued functions and we're interested in just this zero one loss, then for any probability distribution with high probability over a sample of size n, every function in that class has its expected loss close to the sample average um, where how close it is depends on the sample size n, but also this complexity of the class as measured by a combinatorial dimension, the VC dimension. Bottom line for neural nets is this VC dimension is something that increases with the number of parameters, it depends on a piecewise constant nonlinearities, so just threshold, linear threshold functions uh, at each node in the network. Uh, and they showed that no matter what the depth, the uh, VC dimension was bounded by uh, roughly the number of parameters. Okay, so that's um, P here in, in, in this notation. Um, uh, things are not so different for piecewise polynomial nonlinearities. Uh, so piecewise linear, piecewise quadratic, for instance. Although there is a dependence on the, on the depth, um, you could slightly improve that dependence for the case of piecewise linear uh, nonlinearities, so ReLUs, for instance. Um, and, you know, there are related results for standard sigmoids, so, so uh, soft max kind of, kind of functions. Um, uh, but the, as I say, the bottom line is that this combinatorial dimension grows at least linearly in the number of parameters. And so if we go back to the vapnik chervenyankis result, you know, that suggests that in order to have the, the um, empirical risk, so the sample average of the losses, a good indication of the of the risk, the expectation of the loss, we should have this this complexity parameter, this VC dimension, small compared to the sample size. Well, that grows linearly with the parameters, and it turns out you can't do any better. If you want uniform bounds, uh, you want this to to be true for every probability distribution. Um, then uh, you know the inequality is tight within a constant factor, and there are similar results if you want uh, uniform bounds across probability distribution where you'd like to get near optimal performance for um, prediction with some function from that class. So this really makes it look like you need to have the sample size large compared to the, the number of parameters. But of course, uh, you know, practitioners had, had observed that, uh, you know, we really didn't need that, that, um, uh, you know, there were plenty of examples of, of over parameterized networks where the sample size was small compared to the number of parameters, and yet um, uh, the prediction accuracy was still was still good. Um, okay, and um, uh, so the first talk I, I gave at NeurIPS was in Denver in 1996, um, uh, presenting some theorems related to this this question. The in intuition behind those results was um, that when you're working with thresholded real valued functions for classification, so functions like those computed by a neural network, uh, and you're choosing your real valued function by minimizing some sort of a continuous loss, then it seemed like the properties of the class of thresholded functions, fine-grained properties like the VC dimension, uh, might not be so important. <clears throat> so, um, uh, so we have a real valued function that we're going to threshold to determine uh, a label, and we're minimizing a continuous loss like the quadratic loss then we can think of this notion of the, the margin, y times f of x, when y takes values plus minus 1. This is a quantity you want to be positive to get a correct classification of, of x. Uh, and you can think of minimizing this, for instance, quadratic losses as, as optimizing a function of this, a convex function of this margin. Um, and, you know, we might expect in, in those cases that the, the fine grain details of, of functions uh, like the VC dimension of the of the class of functions might might not be so so crucial, um, and oh and and I guess uh, related ideas appeared in the in the linear case where you can define the margin in the input space um, uh, earlier in this in this work of uh, uh, on support vector machines, Bose, Guillaume, and, and, and Vapnik. Um, okay, so the result from from way back then was you know, if you have a multi layer network, is a special case of two layers with a bound on the on the scale of the parameters, in this case, a one norm bound um, at, at each layer, no constraints on the width of the network. So the number of parameters can be as large as you like. Uh, and with high probability, the there's a, a, a bound on the misclassification probability in terms of a data fit term. So um, 
something that penalizes small margins and uh, um, uh, that's this one and a, a complexity term which penalizes you know the size of the parameters but not the number of parameters and and you know the the um, data fitting term here involves involves these margins you're penalizing margins that are less than than some value gamma okay um, so you know the intuition is that a, a classification problem uh, is becoming a regression problem and for regression um, you know, non-parametric regression, we've long known you don't need to have uh, control of the number of parameters in order to control complexity. You can control it in terms of the size of size of parameters. Uh, and so we get, you know, a kind of classical trade-off now between the fit to the training data, in this case, in terms of margins and, and the complexity of the class of functions. There's some sort of complexity penalty in this upper bound. Um, and, and that complexity is, uh, as we've seen, defined in terms of it can be defined in terms of the size of the parameters. And, and so, you know, important point is there's a trade-off here. So, um, you know, it, it, you might uh, be willing to suffer an increase in, in one or other of these terms in order to improve, improve the other one. Um, the following year, Rob Shapiro, Yoav Freund, Wiesan Lee and I had a, a paper about a similar phenomenon in Adaboost, uh, an algorithm that you can think of as sequentially growing a two-layer neural net to greedily optimize a convex loss. Um, and an exponential loss in the margin. Um, uh, and practitioners had earlier observed that even with increasing over parameterization, uh, so you know the the size of this combination of of classifiers, um, uh, you you could have an improvement in uh, in in performance. So the left plot here has uh, train and test error uh, with the zero one loss. Um, uh, and the right-hand plot shows that, you know, the margins improved uh, throughout training. This is showing the distribution of the margins appropriately normalized at three points, uh, at three uh, moments in the, in the training process. Um, and the same improvement in, in performance, you know, as, as over-parameterization uh, increases has been observed more recently in neural nets in this work of uh, Neshavur, Tomioka, and Srebro. Um, and that brings us to the present day and uh, to another case of, of over-parameterization and uh, accurate predictions, although this one, I think, is much more striking. Um, uh, it's all about this observation that deep nets can be trained to zero training error, even when you consider a regression loss um, uh, with near state-of-the-art prediction accuracy, uh, strikingly, even when there's noise in the problem. So uh, these graphs are showing plots of um, performance of three different kinds of uh, deep neural neural network. The x-axis in both cases is showing the level of, of noise that's added to the, to the labels. Um, the top plot is showing how long it takes to get to an essentially perfect fit, so, so uh, essentially zero value of a regression loss on the training sample, and you see you can still achieve a, uh, uh, this near-perfect fit um, quite quickly with a, um, a significant proportion of, uh, a significant amount of noise added. Um, and the bottom plot on the y-axis is showing the test error. So this is uh, prediction accuracy. It's for a classification, uh, a, a particular image classification problem. So this is work of uh, Zhang Benjio Hart, Recht and Vinyals. Um, um, uh, there's similar results uh, had been have, have been observed for uh, other other methods and and specifically for regression problems. Um, you know the striking thing here is there's no trade-off between the fit to the training data and the complexity. You're getting a perfect fit to the training data, um, uh, and and you know it's certainly uh, overfitting because you're getting a fit to the training data that's. Uh, uh, you know, essentially interpolating, uh, certainly much better than the level of noise that's in the data. Uh, so um, certainly overfitting, but um, that overfitting is benign in the sense that uh, it doesn't it doesn't greatly harm predictive accuracy. Um, okay, so it's worth spending a little time reflecting on what's surprising uh, with this phenomenon. Uh, you often hear it's mysterious that deep uh, deep learning methods predict accurately, but the, you know, for instance, they're overparametrized. Um, uh, so um, uh, the number of parameters is much larger than the sample size. But you know, as 
as we've long known, you can control complexity in other ways, for instance, through the scale of the, of the parameters uh, in, the, in the setting of large margin classification. Um, deep learning methods minimize empirical risk uh, without explicitly um, uh, uh, working to, to keep a regularization uh, term small. Um, but, you know, we've long known that you can regularize in some implicit way, for instance, early stopping and gradient methods, you know, there's, there's work on, this is on kernel methods and, and uh, similar ideas were used in proving the statistical com consistency of Adaboost, um, uh, you know, provided that it's stopped uh, uh, soon enough in its, um, uh, in its optimization. Um, deep learning methods find a perfect fit to the data, and yet they predict accurately. Uh, you know, again, this is this is not um, inconsistent with uh, with the theory. Uh, if you can find a function that fits the data perfectly, so it has empirical risk zero, um, but it's not too complex, then then of course uh, the risk can be can be near zero also. Um, uh, you know what we're talking about here is um, is is overfitting, right? Is uh, well, and I should say, um, uh, and that's that's long been long been known. That case uh, of of not too complex functions that fit the data perfectly were that was actually the subject of uh, Les Valiant's famous paper in the eighties. Um, what we're talking about here is fitting uh, fitting noisy data better than we should expect. Right, and um, uh, and and that's really the surprising thing that that um, when we know there's noise in the data and yet we're getting a perfect fit, you know, we know we must have a very complex function to be able to do that. So overfitting, and and you know, this this really is the big big surprise with this phenomenon. So um, uh, by overfitting here, I mean you know, fitting better than the noise level. Uh, I guess noise is um, is ubiquitous in. Uh, uh, in any real real data, uh, but you know some of these examples are particularly striking because they've explicitly added noise, approximately interpolated. You can be confident that we're overfitting, and yet that overfitting is benign. Prediction accuracy is still good. Um, you know this this does go against the statistical wisdom that we've been teaching our um, undergraduate students for for years. It's in all the textbooks that so you don't want to fit the data too well. Otherwise, you're unlikely to predict accurately that you know a, a function that fits too well is is not a reasonable estimate. You know there are lots of examples like this. Um, so from that perspective, this really is a surprising a surprising thing. We shouldn't have a prediction rule fitting too well, but deep networks are trained to fit noisy data perfectly, and and they still predict well. Um, Okay, so this direction um, really got started in a program at the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing in uh, spring. 2017, um, uh, there, there were discussions there between Daniel Shu, um, uh, Matus Telgarski, Misha Belkin and I after a, a, a talk that Ben Reck gave <clears throat> at that program. Um, first work in this direction was by uh, uh, Misha Belkin, Daniel Su, uh, Partha Mitra, um, also work uh, by Sasha Rucklin and Sasha Sibakov and 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 Teng Yuen Liang, um, these these were looking at uh, kernel smoothing and and kernel methods. I'll say a, a little about those in a moment. Um, and and we considered then the simplest problem where uh, benign overfitting could arise. So the linear regression problem. Um, there was lots of other work at the same time uh, in in uh, a variety of directions, uh, and there was a lot of subsequent work. Um, <clears throat> I won't uh, attempt to do it justice here. I will flag a review paper that um, Andrea Montanari, Sasha Rucklin, and I uh, wrote that has appeared in uh, Act in Numerica. Um, and the intuition that we try to convey in that paper, uh, I think, applies to all the cases of benign overfitting that we understand from a from a theoretical perspective. Um, and and that intuition is that in cases where we see benign overfitting. Uh, we can decompose the prediction rule into two pieces. Um, one piece is uh, a piece that's useful for prediction, uh, and it's simple in the classical sense. So all of our statistical learning theory ap applies to, to what I've written as F0 hat here. Um, and the other piece is uh, a complex component. Uh, you can think of it as a spiky component that's useful for benign overfitting, so fitting the noise, 
um, but uh, it's benign. It, it's not neither harmful nor helpful for prediction. Um, uh, so you know, this is this is the the intuition that there's uh, something pretty standard going on with the with the simple piece, and the other piece is is um, uh, rather unusual. Okay, so let's look at an example. Uh, classical example of, of uh, Nutterai Watson kernel smoothing. Uh, and here we want to make a prediction on a point X. We take a weighted average of the YIs, so the, the, the labels we've seen in our sample. We weight them according to uh, how close they are to or how similar they are to the, to the training points, the XIs. Uh, and if, if our X, uh, I'm sorry, how similar the X is to, to the training point XI. Um, and, and if you know x is very close to an xi, we, we might give it a, a, a high weight. Um, uh, the details of that depend on this kernel, uh, written here as k sub h. Um, so the kernel tells us how much weight uh, uh, we should apply when x is, is, has a particular relationship to, to xi, how much weight we should apply to yi. Okay, and um, uh, Misha, Sasha, and, and, and Sasha, uh, you know, I guess this group of authors uh, considered um, uh, kernel smoothing with these strange singular kernels. So these are compact kernels. Um, uh, they're non-zero only on a, on a uh, bounded set, um, but they have this singularity at zero. So they go, the, the kernel function goes to infinity at zero, <clears throat> which means you're putting, you're putting all of the weight on, on yi as you approach xi. Uh, so they have this interpolating property. Um, uh, and the the result here is oh h h here is a bandwidth parameter that tells you you know what's the scale on which you're measuring this this similarity, and so if you suitably choose that h, uh, it turns out you can get minimax optimal rates from from these things. Um, uh, you know, which is really quite striking. Um, so you can think of that in in terms of this intuition that I described uh, as uh, you know, you're doing you're doing something pretty standard for prediction. So using a standard compact kernel like just a constant um, uh, uh, kernel, I the indicator of some of some set, um, and you're adding on top of that this this spiky piece um, that is useful for fitting uh, for for interpolating, but has no real impact on <clears throat> on predictive accuracy. Um, you know, because these these spikes have have very small weight, small norm in in L two P. So very much this sort of um, this sort of intuition. Okay, what I want to concentrate on for the rest of the talk is um, the setting of of linear regression and this phenomenon of benign overfitting in in that setting. So let me say a little bit about uh, linear regression problems, the characterization we can get of when benign overfitting occurs and when it does not. Um, uh, what it tells us about this phenomenon of adversarial examples, um, uh, some extensions to ridge regression, and um, we'll finish with some limitations of, of model-dependent bounds um, uh, in, in this setting. <clears throat> okay, so we're talking about perhaps the simplest possible problem where we might expect to see, uh, where we might hope to see this uh, benign overfitting phenomenon, and that's the setting of linear regression. So we have X's and Y's, the X's are in, uh, you can think of it as Euclidean space, although it could be infinite dimensional. Uh, and we have a real valued response variable that we'd like to predict using those X's, using linear functions of those X's. We're making the assumption that the tails are nice, um, that the conditional expectation of Y given X is actually a linear function, uh, and that the X satisfies some sort of small ball condition. So our probability distributions aren't too degenerate. Um, <clears throat> So just to introduce a little notation, the covariance for our x's, we denote uh, that uh, with this matrix notation sigma. Um, and a crucial property of the, of the covariance is going to be these eigenvalues um, uh, of the covariance matrix. So lambda 1 is the variance in the highest variance direction. Lambda 2 is the variance in the next highest variance direction, and so on. Um, uh, so these lambda i's are going to appear throughout. Um, it's important notation to remember. Um, two other pieces of notation we'll use. Theta star here is the uh, optimal linear, the, the parameter of the optimal linear prediction rule, the one that minimizes the squared error. Uh, 
So our goal is to predict y using linear functions of x with a minimum expected squared squared error in our prediction. And theta star is the is the one that does that. And sigma squared is its performance, its expected loss squared squared difference of the of y and our prediction with with theta star. Okay, so remember the lambda i's, theta star, and and sigma squared. Um, the particular estimator we're considering is the minimum norm estimator. So we have data in the form of n x, y pairs. We'll write the x's as row vectors in a matrix capital X and the y's as a vector of those n responses. So we have a sample of size n. Uh, and our estimator is the minimizer of the norm of a, a parameter that gives us the, the smallest squared error on the sample. So x beta minus y norm squared is the sum across the sample of the squared errors of our predictions with the parameter vector beta. We're minimizing that. And uh, in, in cases where we have some freedom, subject to the, the constraint that we're minimizing it, we'd like to have the smallest norm. Um, and you can write that in terms of you know, the standard least squares estimate, but with a pseudo inverse re replacing an inverse. So x transpose x, pseudo inverse, x transpose y. Okay, why minimum norm? Uh, so, uh, you know, we're motivated by this deep learning situation and, and, uh, and the simple observation that if you run gradient flow initialized at zero, um, uh, so, so theta, the, the time derivative of, of theta is in the negative gradient direction, negative of the gradient of the, of the loss, uh, then you converge to this minimum norm solution. Uh, so, you know, that's the that's the estimator that we're considering here. So anywhere I write theta hat, it's this minimum norm uh, estimator. And in the case where an interpolating solution is possible, you know, that's that's the, the situation we're going to be concentrating on. Um, as I mentioned, the um, uh, criterion of interest here is the excess prediction error. So we're interested in minimizing the squared squared error of our predictions. We'd like it to be as close as possible to the optimal value that it can take, which is, of course, the squared error of this theta star, this optimal linear prediction rule. Uh, and, you know, it's easy to show the, the that, um, you know, the cross terms here disappear. We get just uh, some quadratic, this excess um, risk here is just a quadratic term in the error of our, um, our estimate of theta star. Okay, so, so, um, you know, if, uh, the quality of the estimate is measured using the covariance matrix sigma. And so you can see here, um, you know, that the uh, one important role that the eigenvalues of sigma play, they tell us, you know, in these, in these particular directions, the lambda one is the, the most important direction in which we should be estimating theta star correctly, um, because in that direction, you know, we've got a big weight associated with, with our error. Um, lambda two and lambda three and so on. As as these lambdas get smaller, we we care less and less about the accuracy of our uh, prediction in that in that direction. Okay, um, so that's the criterion of interest R of theta hat, uh, and and let's talk about the benign overfitting situation. So what do I mean by overfitting? Um, you know, to be precise, in this setting, you could think of a ridge regression formulation of this problem, where we add a regularization term in terms of the the um, uh, squared Euclidean norm of our parameter vector. So it's empirical empirical loss uh, empirical risk plus uh, a, a ridge regression term. You could equivalently think of that optimization problem in its norm constrained form, where we're saying, well, we will keep the uh, you know, with, I guess, a data dependent um, B, something that's uh, um, uh, constraining the size of our parameters, we could think of it as, you know, optimizing performance on the data subject to that constraint. Or you could think of it in a, in a, in a fit constrained form, you know, subject to the fit to the data being better than such and such, we want to minimize the, the norm of the parameters that we get. And we're interested in the last case, but where this C is much too small. Right? So where we're saying that the empirical risk that we see is actually way smaller than the best possible, the, um, uh, the, true, uh, the, the optimal true risk. So that's the overfitting regime that we're, that we're considering. We're actually going to look at the case where C is zero. 
Uh, so we have to have uh, have to be in a sufficiently high dimension for that to be for that to be true. Um, uh, so in we're in that situation. We've got our estimator minimizing the norm of the parameter vector, subject to the constraint that. Um, it achieves the minimum, and, and we're interested in these cases where the minimum is actually zero. Uh, what that means is that for all n of these data points, our linear predictions, you know, xi transpose theta hat, uh, is they're all equal to the corresponding yi's. Okay, so we're we're nailing it on every every data point. So really, we're asking the question: you know, when can we take all of that label noise that's that's in those yi's? Uh, and hide it in the theta hats, you know, in the sense of uh, uh, getting these perfect predictions without hurting the predictive accuracy. Okay, so um, uh, this is the main result. This is a kind of combination of results from um, work with Phil Long, Gabo Lugoshi, um, and Alex Sigler, and uh, uh, later work with, with Alex. Um, okay, so we're talking about any linear regression problem. Uh, the nth eigenvalue of sigma needs to be positive. That means we can get a zero, um, uh, zero empirical risk on the problem. Um, there's, a, there's a notion of effective dimension that we call k star, uh, which is the, um, when, you, when you eliminate the k highest variance directions in the um, in the X space, you're left with a covariance in the remaining subspace that has an effective rank that's big compared to the sample size. So this RK of sigma is a notion of effective rank when we've eliminated that K-dimensional uh, heaviest subspace. So we'll, we'll come to definitions uh, in, in a moment, but you know, for now, think of it as we want to have um, uh, a high effective rank of the covariance in that subspace after we've taken out the heaviest k, uh, k star dimensions. And the result is that the excess risk is no more than, you know, splits into two terms, this upper bound. There's a bias term and a variance term. Bias term is due to uh, kind of the piece of the y's that you can attribute to the theta stars. The variance term is the piece you can attribute to the noise. And the variance term has um, uh, two quantities, one that looks like effective dimension divided by n, so k star should be small compared to the sample size, and the other that looks like n divided by another notion of effective dimension. Okay, so that effective dimension should be large compared to the sample size if we want this, um, this upper bound to be small. And there's a corresponding lower bound. Um, you know, we need to, the, the, the lower bound shows that we can't hope to do any better than the upper bound in general. It's for a more specific situation. Uh, you can think of the X as, as being Gaussian. Uh, you can think of the theta star as being uh, made symmetric. So we take a kind of random sign flips of, of components for any theta star vector. And then you can show that the expected um, excess risk is lower bounded by exactly the same same quantity, you know, up to a constant factor. Um, the, the bias here, we'll have a little more to say about that later. It's an explicit term um, uh, that depends on the, the theta star uh, and the covariance, the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. Okay, so we have these precise, um, you know, up to, up to constants, precise upper and lower bounds on the excess risk uh, that this um, minimum norm uh, estimator provides. So what are these effective ranks? Um, uh, little rk, so, so remember we're throwing away the k highest variance directions, so the k biggest eigenvalues of our covariance matrix, and we're left in this other subspace, and we're interested in the pattern of eigenvalues in this, uh, of the covariance in that, in that lower variance subspace. Little rk of sigma is the one norm of the remaining eigenvalues divided by the infinity norm. So it's a notion of rank. Um, capital RK is the one norm squared divided by the two norm squared. So another notion of effective rank. All right, um, you know, not, not, too, uh, not too distant. Um, just to get some intuition about these quantities, if we're talking about uh, an identity matrix, identity covariance, so, so isotropic, um, uh, X's, uh, then the effective rank is just the dimension. 
right? Um, you know, both of these quantities are just are just equal to the the dimension. Um, if we're talking about something that's finite dimension, uh, then we can write the effect of rank as just you know the actual rank uh, of the of the matrix times a notion of symmetry. And and the two notions of symmetry um, in these two cases are slightly different. Uh, the little rk notion of symmetry compares uh, a one norm to an infinity norm, and the the capital RK notion compares a one norm to a two norm, all right? But both of those uh, quantities, the, the the symmetry quantities, lie between, you know, something close to zero and something close to one, right? So you can think of it as, um, uh, you know, something like a rank, but if things are more symmetric, um, then, then, you know, we have a bigger value of this effect of rank, less symmetric and smaller value. Okay, so that's that's the measure of of sort of how how close things are to uh, something like a, an isotropic situation in this subspace after we've taken out the the K star um, uh, heaviest uh, directions. So um, you know our our effective dimension depends on one notion of effective rank, uh, and the um, bounds depend on another notion of effective rank, the upper and lower bounds. All right. Um, uh, when I say effective dimension, you know, the thing to notice here is if we look at the specifics of the bias term, we're actually paying for everything that goes on in that orthogonal subspace. So the bias that we incur is as if we were predicting zero in all but the first k star directions. All right. Um, and, and actually the variance, the contribution to the variance is, is um, in, in the uh, from from the K star subspace is as if we were predicting just with the with that um, uh, K star dimensional linear prediction rule. So um, you know that's where all the action happens. That's where all of our um, uh, accurate prediction comes from. And and it turns out that the um, other subspace is just a just a nuisance from the prediction perspective. <clears throat> okay, and and you know this is very much the intuition that we saw earlier uh, that, you know, in this case, our linear um, prediction rule decomposes into uh, a prediction piece, which is this k-star dimensional linear prediction corresponding to the, uh, you know, those directions with the highest variance, lambda 1 through lambda k-star, and, and the orthogonal piece, um, which is, you know, in all the other directions, that orthogonal piece needs to be very high dimensional, needs to be a high dimension compared to n, um, and, and that's because we're using it to fit the noise. We're using it for, for the overfitting uh, piece, but it's benign, um, you know, provided that it, it really is a genuinely high dimension. This capital R K star is, is large compared to, to the sample size N. All right, so um, uh, that's what's going on. Uh, you know, you the the intuition between why it happens is, um, you know, it's all about the pattern of eigenvalues that we see. So that mix of the uh, the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix, the the um, relative levels of variance in different directions in our input space, determines two things. It, t it determines where the label noise from the um, uh, from the 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 Ys. Uh, gets distributed in in our um, our estimate theta hat, and it also determines how important errors in different directions are, right? And and it's the balance between those two things that that leads to the result. Um, you can think of it as uh, 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 the the you can think of the situation as being you know when, when we don't want to have uh, prediction accuracy harmed, all that noise energy that's in the labels. You know, needs to needs to be reflected in the theta hat. We have to get those those labels right. Um, uh, but in order to do that, to to not harm predictive accuracy, that noise has to be distributed across lots of uh, unimportant directions. Uh, and and you know that's what um, uh, we need to have happen for this benign overfitting phenomenon. So you know we certainly have to have a large number of unimportant directions. Uh, so overparameterization is essential. Um, you know more more of these of these unimportant directions than than there are uh, samples. Um, uh, so you know p needs to be large compared to n, of course, uh, 
um, uh, but they they actually have to be uh, unimportant, so small small eigenvalue directions. Um, and you know, ideally, they'd be roughly equal in their in their unimportance in the in the in the level of variance in those directions. But things can be more asymmetric if there are uh, many more than n of them, um, where n is the sample size. Okay, so just going back to the results, you know, we've we've got these upper and lower bounds in terms of um, you know an, an effective dimension here and 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 these effective rank quantities. Um, uh, a very natural question to ask here is, you know, well, in what situations is this R of theta hat going to be small? And let's think just about asymptotics. You know, as the sample size grows, when are we going to have excess risk going to zero? All right, that's complicated by the the bias term here. Um, uh, so we can actually replace that bias term by something by an upper bound that applies for any fixed theta star. So we're sort of um, uh, uh, decoupling the impact of the of the bias from the the more interesting and 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 you know uh, less classical I guess variance term. Um, so we you know by plugging in a suitable upper bound we can say well let's talk about an asymptotic um, uh, property uh, that uh, you know has the upper bound on on these things going to zero as as the sample size grows and ask the question you know for what patterns of of eigenvalues do we have? What kind of covariance matrices do we have this, the, the limit of these three terms? The first one is an upper bound on the bias term and the other Um, which is, you know, in all the other directions, that orthogonal piece needs to be very high dimensional, needs to be a high dimension compared to n. Um, and, and that's because we're using it to fit the noise. We're using it for, for the overfitting uh, piece, but it's benign, um, you know, provided that it, it really is a genuinely high dimension. This capital R K star is, is large compared to, to the sample size n. All right, so um, uh, that's what's going on. Uh, you know, you the the intuition between why it happens is, um, you know, it's all about the pattern of eigenvalues that we see. So that mix of the uh, the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix, the the um, relative levels of variance in different directions in our input space, determines two things. It, t it determines where the label noise from the um, uh, from the 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 Ys. Uh, gets distributed in in our um, our estimate theta hat, and it also determines how important errors in different directions are, right? And and it's the balance between those two things that that leads to the result. Um, you can think of it as uh, 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 the the you can think of the situation as being you know when, when we don't want to have uh, prediction accuracy harmed, all that noise energy that's in the labels. You know, needs to needs to be reflected in the theta hat. We have to get those those labels right. Um, uh, but in order to do that, to to not harm predictive accuracy, that noise has to be distributed across lots of uh, unimportant directions. Uh, and and you know that's what um, uh, we need to have happen for this benign overfitting phenomenon. So you know we certainly have to have a large number of unimportant directions. Uh, so overparameterization is essential. Um, you know more more of these of these unimportant directions than than there are uh, samples. Um, uh, so you know p needs to be large compared to n, of course, um, uh, but they they actually have to be uh, unimportant. So small small eigenvalue directions, um, and you know ideally they'd be roughly equal in their in their unimportance in the in the in the level of variance in those directions. But things can be more asymmetric if there are. Uh, many more than n, n of them, um, where n is the sample size. Okay, so just going back to the results, you know, we've we've got these upper and lower bounds in terms of, um, you know, an, an effective dimension here and and, and these effective rank quantities. Um, uh, a very natural question to ask here is, you know, well, in what situations is this R of theta hat going to be small? 
And let's think just about asymptotics. You know, as the sample size grows, when are we going to have excess risk going to zero? All right. That's complicated by the, the bias term here. Um, uh, so we can actually replace that bias term by something, by an upper bound that applies for any fixed theta star. So we're sort of um, uh, uh, decoupling the impact of the of the bias from the the more interesting and 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 you know less classical I guess variance term. Um, so we you know by plugging in a suitable upper bound we can say well let's talk about an asymptotic um, uh, property uh, that uh, you know has the upper bound on, on these things going to zero as, as the sample size grows and ask the question, you know, for what patterns of, of eigenvalues do we have? What kind of covariance matrices do we have this, the, the limit of these three terms? The first one is an upper bound on the bias term and the other two were these, were these variance terms. When do we have that quantity going to zero as sample size grows? So, um, you know, it's somewhat surprising. In the infinite dimensional setting for a fixed pattern of eigenvalues, you can ask, well, maybe if they decrease exponentially, you know, it turns out that's too fast. You can't ever have this thing go to zero. If they decrease polynomially, you know, uh, as a slower and slower decrease, of course, you want the sum of them to be finite uh, because, you know, the total variance in the, in, in the um, x's should be, should be finite. But it turns out that um, uh, with a polynomial rate of growth, you've got to be right at the edge of some ability, right? The, that it's only when the lambda i goes down like um, one over i times one over log of i uh, to some power that you have this, this nice asymptotic uh, behavior, um, which is quite striking, right? You've got to be right at the edge of, of diverging in, in terms of the rate of decrease of these eigenvalues. Very, very specific kind of pattern of decrease of eigenvalues and and seems like uh you know circumstances should be really rather special for that to happen and for you to see this um, benign benign overfitting kind of phenomenon as as the sample size grows um but it turns out that if you um uh truncate at some finite dimension you get a very different story uh and um you know uh, I've put in here an exponential decay plus some isotropic noise truncated at some large large dimension p sub n. Uh, but you know, actually, anything that's quickly decreasing and then something that's that's um, uh, whose sum diverges. So maybe a constant value, maybe a very slowly decreasing value. You know, anything anything like that that gives this long uh, long flat tail. Um, uh, you know, you get you get the benign overfitting behavior. Um, and you can quantify things, you know, the excess risk looks like the, the kind of energy in the tail divided by n plus something that's, you know, small whenever the dimension, uh, the point at which things are trun truncated, uh, is large compared to the sample size. Okay, so, um, uh, so you know, the finite dimensional case seems like, um, you know, finite but large compared to sample size seems like a much more generic phenomenon. You know, you've got You've got this quickly converging part where all the prediction action happens, and then you've got this part where there's sort of noise in all directions, and that's uh, precisely when you'll get uh, this. Th these are the situations when you'll see benign overfitting in linear regression. Okay, um, let's switch gears. Let's think about uh, adversarial examples. Another phenomenon that's been observed uh, in practice in in deep learning. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, several years ago now, there was this observation that you could take a trained deep network uh, uh, and, um, and an example that it uh, classifies correctly and with uh, an appropriate careful choice of a very small perturbation of that example and, and you know, in, in an image classification, uh, image classification task, it's an imperceptible perturbation. Uh, and and with that very slight change, you get a huge change in the output of the network. It changes from something that's correct to something that's um, uh, that's incorrect. But but you know, with a soft max output, it's a highly confident incorrect classification. Okay, so this is this is kind of a striking property. Um, uh, in fact, we can ask uh, whether we'll see this same sort of sensitivity in our linear regression setting. Uh, and and you know, we should completely expected there because we're taking we're taking this high energy noise part 
remember the noise energy in our in our labels is growing linearly with the sample size and and we're injecting that noise into our parameter estimates and so we should expect some direction in parameter space where you know we've taken this this high energy noise and and perturbed things it's not affecting our prediction accuracy because presumably in that direction where we're seeing a very low variance um, but of course you know there is a direction the direction that the the noise vector gets transformed to that will lead to a, a very big change in the output. And, and you can be quite specific about it, you know, using the results that I presented earlier. The X, if, if you're in a situation where the excess risk is nice and small, so you're predicting uh, near optimally, then you can show that the sensitivity to a unit perturbation in this uh, sort of noise-induced direction in parameter space um, is large compared to some uh, problem dependent constant times one over square root of alpha. So if if the excess risk is no more than alpha, then this sensitivity grows like one over square root of alpha. So you know inevitably, if you're doing well um, in this overfitting setting, um, then you've got huge sensitivity to uh, an adversarial choice of a perturbation of the of the input. Okay. Um, uh, and you know, again, this is this is consistent with this intuition that uh, you know we can split um, uh, the the prediction rule into a, a piece that's useful for prediction and a piece that is uh, fitting to the noise and and is therefore spiky, right? To fit to the noise, it needs to it needs to be uh, to have large excursions, uh, so be large in sort of an L infinity sense. Um, uh, to be benign, to have little impact on prediction, it needs to be small in an L2P sense. So it's got to be something that's sort of spiky, right? Small, small um, uh, on average, but um, but large, uh, large uh, across the space. Okay. Um, we also have extensions in the direction of ridge regression. So this is Alex, Alex Sigler. Um, so here we're, we're saying, you know, we, we'd considered earlier the lambda equals zero case, right? When we were thinking of fitting perfectly and, and subject to that constraint, minimizing the norm. And here, when you, when you add in a positive uh, regularization, positive value of the regularization coefficient lambda, then you have a ridge regression problem. You can view it as you know, minimizing the, when, when lambda is positive, minimizing the fit to the data, plus uh, a penalty for the, for the scale of the, of the parameters. Um, lambda equals zero is the, is the um, uh, minimum norm interpolating solution we were considering. Uh, uh, lambda bigger than zero, but still very small, you'll still be overfitting, right? You'll still be choosing um, uh, parameters that get a better fit to the data than you should expect from the noise level. Uh, and so, you know, we're really considering that whole range of solutions from interpolating through overfitting, so under-regularized, through to sort of classical levels of regularization. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting to see uh, what happens uh, across that whole regime. We can get tight bounds on, on these bias in various terms in, that, in, in, in these cases. Uh, it's really rather similar to the lambda equals zero case. Those notions of effective rank uh, get get boosted by by lambda right so we get um we get quantities that that look bigger which is you know always always better for us right we we our k star was defined in terms of the the little r being big compared to the sample size and we had a uh, a variance um uh, term in the upper bound that was uh, you know n divided by this capital r so these the, the that improves as as lambda gets large um, turns out, you know, a, a big value of lambda is not always a good thing um, because we're effectively estimating a covariance in a high dimensional setting where we get a terrible estimate. Um, you know, it's not too hard to come up with examples where the optimal uh, lambda in the sense of, you know, this expression for theta hat uh, is, is negative, right? Because you can decrease the, the, the bias that you see uh, without having a significant um, impact on the variance by having that that lambda negative, which is a you know rather unusual um, non-classical sort of sort of uh, situation. Okay, so this is the result. As I say, you know the big change here is that that we introduce lambdas into these various um, uh, effective rank terms. <clears throat> 
uh, but you can get again precise upper and lower bounds you know modulate these constant factors um, on the excess risk that this ridge regression estimate gives us okay and let me finish with um, uh, something about limitations of model dependent bounds. Okay, so um, uh, so what do I mean by model dependent bound? So uh, you know, often we're used to analyzing the performance of uh, a prediction algorithm uh, in terms of the complexity of a uh, of the prediction rule that it returns, where you know we're measuring particular properties of that prediction rule. So for instance, if we have an algorithm or return some F that has nice small empirical risk, so it does well on a, on a sample, fits the data well, um, and it's simple in some sense, you know, maybe it's a multi-layer network that has a small product of the spectral norms of the weight matrices, um, or, or maybe the rank of those uh, parameter matrices, um, uh, you know, those, those are low rank, are low rank things, you know, all kinds of notions of, of complexity that we might consider. Um, they're properties of this prediction rule F. Um, a model dependent bound is something that gives us the, that we can you know use to infer from those properties, perhaps from the sample size, um, what's the performance of that um, of that prediction rule going to be like. Um, uh, one example of this sort of family of bounds is uniform deviation bounds, where we say, well, if if we think of F as having a small spectral norm, let's think of the class of functions computed by nets of a certain architecture with spectral norms bounded by such and such. Let's call the functions in that class. You know, maybe it uh, depends on the properties of all the functions in this capital F class, depends on the sample size. But then we could apply that to say, well, small, small sample average of losses implies expectations nice and small. Um, so, you know, this is a standard uh, style of analysis for um, uh, uh, in statistical learning theory. Um, there's this nice work by uh, uh, Vaishnav Nagarajan and, and Zico Kolta showing that um, uh, uniform deviation bounds of this sort um, sometimes can't help in these interpolating situations. Um, so, you know, they come up with, a, with a, a nice example of a classification problem where you take a single gradient step uh, that leads to a function that has zero empirical risk. It's it's you know kind of a um, uh, uh, naive Bayes uh, sort of approach. Has zero empirical risk, and it turns out that the function that you get um, uh, predicts uh, predicts accurately for the probability distribution that they that they consider. But the design of that distribution, in particular its symmetry, implies that any uh, uniform deviation bound for any function class that contains the, the function that you, that you see uh, is necessarily large. So, so applied in this way, uniform deviation bounds you know, can't be useful for, for analyzing the performance of interpolating, interpolating methods such as the one that they, that they present. Um, so you know, that's, that's quite an enlightening uh, uh, observation. So um, uh, in joint work with, with Phil Long, we considered, uh, so not classification problems, but back to linear regression problems, and uh, not uniform deviation bounds, but this broader family of any model dependent bound. So anything that looks at properties of the prediction rule uh, together with the sample size and attempts to give a bound on the, on the uh, excess risk of, of such a um, uh, prediction rule. Okay, so we're in the linear regression setting again. We're considering this minimum norm estimator. And what we're shooting for is um, um, a model dependent bound, epsilon. So this is something that's a function of our, our prediction rule, a function of theta hat. It's a function of the sample size n. And we'd like it to be uh, uniformly good in the sense that the excess risk that we incur is no more than this bound with high probability. Uh, and that's got to be true for um, you know, all reasonable distribution. So it's anything with, with nice tails. So like, uh, you know, one, one sub Gaussian, uh, is the precise, precise definition for these, uh, probability distributions that we're concerned with. So that's a uniform model dependent bound. Um, uh, the other, uh, definition that we need for the, for the result is, um, 
is concerned with the dependence of this bound epsilon on sample size. <clears throat> now, we might expect things to improve as the sample size grows. Um, but all we're asking for is not that monotonically decreasing property, but just that it doesn't increase too rapidly. So if, if I were to double the sample size, I wouldn't want my bound to get worse by more than a constant factor. Okay, that's, that's what we call a bounded anti-monotonic property for our um, uh, model-dependent bound epsilon. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, one, one other piece of terminology we need is, is there's a precise definition for most natural numbers n, right? Uh, you know, that you look at sort of increasing subsets and you have a, a growing proportion, uh, 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 a large proportion of those, of those subsets having a pro property satisfied. Um, uh, you can, if you're curious, about the specifics, you can uh, uh, check that out. You know, the, the point is that we just have a definition of most um, most natural numbers that you know is, is is rather natural. Okay, and the theorem the theorem says that um, for every n, you can come up with distributions uh, and in a, a, a suitable um, uh, a suitable linear regression problem of of a suitable dimension. Um, uh, so that you know, for any um, uh, model-dependent bound that satisfies these conditions that I've described, um, with high probability, the minimum norm estimated does well. So you're in a benign overfitting situation. The excess risk is like one over square root of n. You know, performing really nicely um, as the as the sample size increases, uh, and yet epsilon is necessarily a bad bound. All right. So for for most sample sizes. Uh, with um, a pretty significant probability across the samples, uh, probability over, over training samples, the bound that you see is going to be a bad one. It's going to be bigger than a constant, even though the truth is um, uh, with high probability, you know, less than one over square root of n. So these epsilons need to be, you know, pretty terrible, pretty terrible bounds uh, in, in these cases. Um, the joint distributions here are, are really pretty natural things, right? The X is Gaussian, the Y is, um, you know, conditioned on X, it's, it's a, a mixture of a small number of Gaussians. So it's, it's, nothing, it's nothing too bizarre. Um, uh, uh, the, the distributions that demonstrate this sort of, this sort of bad behavior of, of model dependent bounds. So the message here is, you know, any um, model dependent bound, anything that just has information about the prediction rule uh, and, and the sample size, you know, satisfying these conditions. So it can't increase too quickly with the sample size, which uh, seems seems like quite a, a mild condition, uh, is necessarily sometimes very loose. Um, and, and the point here is that you need to have more information about the distribution. So just to summarize, uh, this benign overfitting phenomenon, it's a situation when we're uh, very far from, from the usual regime, the trade-off between fit to the training data and the complexity of a prediction rule. For linear regression, we understand it very well. We need this long flat tail of the covariance eigenvalues. We need you know, uh, uh, the, the big eigenvalues where all the action happens, all the prediction is happening, and then this long flat tail where our minimum norm interpolating um, estimate um, uh, is hiding all the noise. It's hiding the noise in those many different unimportant directions. Um, so our linear prediction splits into the k-star dimensional component, which is good for prediction and simple in a classical way that you know classical statistical learning theory tells us about, and a benign overfitting component that's good just for overfitting and doesn't hurt prediction. We need those roughly equally unimportant parameter directions. Seems like finite dimensional data is is helpful. You need a very specific eigenvalue decay to see this phenomenon in infinite dimensions, but it's a generic phenomenon um, when you have uh, uh, truncated slow decay. Um, but it leads to huge sensitivity to adversarial perturbations. Um, uh, we've seen we can extend these results to ridge regression. Uh, we've seen some limitations of model dependent bounds. Um, uh, what about next steps? So this works about overfitting in linear regression uh, with a minimum Euclidean norm. Uh, you know, there's um, nice work on the implicit bias for uh, two-layer linear networks of Azul et al. Um, and, and building on that, we have some results about 
you know, interpolating in, in two layer uh, linear networks in the linear regression setting. Um, uh, regarding moving beyond, that's essentially a Euclidean norm still. Regarding moving beyond the Euclidean norm, um, if you're willing to assume that the XY pairs are Gaussian, there's a nice paper in this conference by uh, Freddie Kohler, Li Zha Zhao, uh, Danica Sutherland, and Nati Sribro that applies Gordon's uh, min-max inequality to extend the upper bounds to, to other norms, but that's still in the linear case. Uh, for deep networks, you can consider scenarios where a linear approximation to a neural net is accurate, the, the NTK regime, for instance. There are results for kernel classes, for random features, for two-layer NTK models. Um, but these are all essentially linear. The most exciting question is what happens in the nonlinear setting, in particular what happens for deep networks where this phenomenon was observed. Do they also exhibit a decomposition into a simple component and a benign overfitting component? Um, you know, I think that's a very, very exciting question. All right, a big thank you to um, NSF and Simons Foundation, uh, to uh, a group of great collaborators, Naladri Chatterjee, who was a PhD student at Berkeley, now at Stanford, um, Phil Long at, at Google, Gabor Lugoshi, Pompeo Fabra, Andrea Montanari at Stanford, uh, Sasha Rachlin at MIT, and Alex Sigler, who's a PhD student uh, at UC Berkeley. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, it was a pleasure to hear Peter's talk. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Uh, and that was a great talk by Peter. Uh, we're gonna do the question answering session now. So if you have additional questions, please add them to the chat and uh, we'll have a look. So I'll go ahead and start with uh, one of the questions from the, um, from the chat, which was, uh, is it possible to think of neural networks as uh, massaging the input representation uh, into the right shape for benign overfitting? Uh, in other words, if I looked at, say for example, the representation, uh, say uh, right before the neural net's final layer, would it have the sort of eigenvalue patterns that you described in the, uh, in the talk? Yeah, that's, an, that's a really interesting question. I don't know what happens empirically. Um, you know, it is a more complex situation because, so, so if we were to choose uh, all of the, the pre-processing, the, the, um, uh, the functions that define the last layer features uh, and then solve a linear regression problem, uh, and we had enough parameters in that last layer that we could do a, a, a perfect fit to arbitrary data, um, then we'd be in exactly the situation. Um, uh, you know, that's not typically true. You don't typically at the last layer have, have uh, a neural net with um, enough parameters there that you, you have this, uh, the interpolation is all happening there. So we're in a really rather different situation um, uh, for the usual choices of, um, of, of architectures for a particular sample size. Um, we do have this, we, we are in the over, over parameterized regime uh, in, and in a setting as we've seen from these um, uh, experimental observations in a setting where you can get a perfect fit to the data, um, but that's not typically from that, that uh, last layer. So is you know, something more complex is, is going on uh, in, in a way that uses the, the nonlinear representation the the um the parameters enter nonlinearly into into this this processing but you know a, a, a fascinating question there's another way of asking the same question and, and that is instead of thinking of the last layer you think of it as um uh you know a neural tangent kernel sort of representation so uh you know this there's been a, a huge amount of work in that direction lately uh so so if you look at um uh, a small ball in parameter space around the the parameters that your your um uh, algorithm has has arrived at, uh, then of course you know there's a there's a kind of Taylor uh, first order Taylor series approximation that that means you have something that's approximately linear in that in that neighborhood, um, uh, and in that in that setting we might think of this as as being you know uh, we we really are close to the linear linear situation, um, um, uh, and and we might we might expect to see something similar something similar there it's a little different of course because you know you're choosing which part of this uh, you're choosing both the representation uh, so the kernel in that case uh, and the linear parameters so um, it's certainly more complex than the case that we we're able to analyze 
but yeah, really interesting question. Um, I just have a follow-up question. So, um, right. The, the point is empirically, these top layers are often pretty small. So we could look at the eigen inspection decay, but it's perhaps not so interesting. But my follow-up question was, um, you know, basically to what you're saying about this uh, local linear uh, regime that, uh, like, would there be any sense in, say, for example, um, you know, because at the end of the day, every node is fitting some error signal. And is there a sense in which we could look at something, you know, would we get any insights or is there any analog into uh, an eigen spectrum for the network as a whole uh, in, in uh, the multi-layer case as opposed to the, the one-layer case by, again, yeah, just doing a Taylor expansion, seeing what we find. Um, and, uh, you know, is there anything we can suggest to practitioners to say, hey, this is, would be an interesting spectrum to look at? Uh, yeah, um, uh, it's it's a it's an interesting question. I, um, uh, you know, what the the conditions that we arrive at here are conditions on the on the population covariance, uh, right. and uh, you know, one of the the kind of features of this analysis is is that um, the population covariance is really very different from the empirical covariance that you see. You know, we, we split things into these two subspaces. There's a low dimensional subspace and there it's very classical. You know, the, the covariance that you'll see in, in, in that subspace is, uh, is going to be pretty close to the population covariance, uh, you know, in cases where you do, do see this benign overfitting. In the orthogonal subspace, you're very far from, from uh, what, you would, what you would expect uh, from the population. You know, there we have something that's, uh, you know, perhaps it's close to isotropic in that in that high dimensional subspace. But of course, we've only got a sample of size n. So we see something that's, you know, really very far from isotropic. So so what we can measure empirically, um, you know, is uh, could could perhaps be consistent with one of these situations, but it's not clear that it's, uh, it's certainly clear that it's very far from the the population case. So, so you know, this is kind of one of the point, the the the, the point we we're making with this uh, the the sort of impossibility result that I mentioned at the end. Um, that you know, it's hard to um, distinguish cases where this uh, phenomenon occurs from cases where it, where it doesn't. Um, you know, de depending on what it is you measure. Um, uh, so, you know, this is a maybe long-winded way of saying, I'm not sure that there's a clear experiment to perform to understand, uh, understand say, you know, from a neural tangent kernel plus linear um, regression perspective, uh, what's going on in one of these, one of these problems. But, um, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that that's, uh, that's not an impossibility result, right? I mean, I think, um, uh, for instance, what the, the result that we had uh, did, does not rule out uh, doing something uh, cleverer to estimate a spectrum uh, of, of, of eigenvalues. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think that's a fascinating direction. Right. Uh, I, th I think I see your point. But the population spectrum in the tail is like, we're, we're going to kind of know where the spectrum is bad, like uh, that, because everything's small in that, in that space and jumbo together, right? So... Uh, we might not know the precise shape, but we all know like the overall mass is small. So um, it, that's right. So it's, it's not clear we should be that concerned that we can't exactly get the shape of the spectrum in the, you know, in the tail. Right. I, I mean, yeah, we're seeing something that's very different from the, from the population covariance. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, and in and in good cases, we, we're we're still expecting that, right? That's um, uh, that that that's the way things are for sure. Okay, um, I'm going to. There's a there are a couple of questions uh, with regards to uh, adversarial uh, uh, the adversarial setting, adversarial examples, and. Um, Maybe I'll just ask broadly my interpretation of this question, which is what does benign overfitting uh, have to say about um, say defending ourselves against uh, such adversaries? Um, 
Yeah, that's that's a good a good question. Um, you know, in the linear case, it's pretty clear that uh, it leads to a very brittle uh, prediction uh, function um, because you know you're taking all of that that noise and uh, injecting it into the parameters in some sense, right? So so in linear regression um, uh, with a minimum the 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 minimum norm, norm estimator that we we considered that's um, uh, you know there's a linear function that maps from the the labels um, uh, which you can think of as signal plus noise so maps from the noise into the uh, the parameter estimates so there's going to be this direction in parameter space where you know you have a huge amount of energy um, all of that noise energy it's growing linearly with the sample size um, is is being being pushed into the um, into that parameter estimate. So that's a direction of, of great sensitivity. Um, and, and, you know, in some sense, uh, we, we should expect um, huge sensitivity in general. If you just think about what it is we're asking for a perfect fit to training data together with good, good predictive accuracy, when we know that there's noise in that training data, uh, you know, that, that means that we've got something that's, that's got this, these significant excursions at the training points um, that are fitting the data accurately, but they must be excursions of the order of uh, the standard deviation of the noise, right? And, and yet we're predicting accurately. Uh, uh, so, you know, on average under the probability distribution, uh, we don't If you're willing to assume that the XY pairs are Gaussian, there's a nice paper in this conference by uh, Freddie Kohler, Li Zha Zhao, uh, Danica Sutherland, and Nati Sridro that applies Gordon's uh, min-max inequality to extend the upper bounds to, to other norms. But that's still in the linear case. Uh, for uh, there also, or at least it's consistent with, with a similar linear phenomenon high dimensional linear phenomenon um, underlying things. Um, but, you know, that's a, that's a speculation. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna reinterpret a question. So, uh, I think the intent of this question was, uh, is the relationship between, uh, you know, understanding this benign overfitting and say, um, uh, out of distribution uh, generalization. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what the question is, and I'm I'm not sure I can I can find it in the in the chat. Um, you know, in in some sense, uh, this phenomenon of adversarial examples is really all about um, uh, a big difference between uh, what you see. Yeah, exactly. In, in the training data and the test distribution and, you know, what happens under, under different circumstances, you know, where you are right. explicitly searching for a direction where, where you've, you're far from having this good performance. Um, uh, so, you know, I mean, I think that, that phenomenon is really a, a special case of um, what happens when you change your, your test distribution to, to something else. Um, and, and the question is, is about the connection. So yeah, so I'm not sure what the uh, the details of the connection, but the reason I asked it, say for example, is because uh, you're right. Like, look, this adversarial cases; these are uh, out of distribution examples. But in a sense, you're searching for a bad distribution here. And yeah. suppose we start thinking of the other cases, which is, you know, the reason deep learning is so successful. Uh, is, um, you know, often really goes beyond our IID generalization theory. These representations are good and they truly work pretty well on, uh, at least on a reasonable set of like very different distributions. So uh, if we were to say, how do we start thinking about that? And for example, do the results you discussed today uh, shed any light on that and, and maybe not these adversarial cases? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, 
uh, if you think about, I mean, I'm I'm always going back to the linear case because we understand it, but uh, right. uh, uh, and and it feels like uh, kind of um, uh, quite speculative to to infer infer um, what goes on in the in the case of uh, deep nets. But if you think about the linear case in that setting, you know the the notion of simplicity there is really there's this low dimensional subspace, and that's and that's where your prediction is is happening, and and uh, you know things are things are looking good there. Um, and, and, you know, you've got this very high dimensional subspace where uh, nothing's going on uh, in the sense of there's, there's very low variance, um, you know, in that, in that subspace. Uh, it's not illuminated by the distribution, if you like. Um, you know, you could imagine changing the distribution around. So instead of having that heavy subspace where all the action's happening, you know, things are tilted or shifted slightly or something, and you're emphasizing some new directions in 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 this orthogonal overfitting subspace, um, you know, unless you were very unlucky and and those new directions really did line up with this big spike where the noise lies, things aren't going to change very much. You're going to get a smooth transition from you know all of the all of my prediction predictive accuracy was coming out of this direction, and I'm not messing with it too much by changing changing my distribution a little. I, I guess I should be saying you know changing the shape of the covariance a little. Um, even if I'm making these these directions I'm relying on to hide the noise a little heavier, a little higher variance, unless I really um, uh, align with that, um, uh, you know, random direction in this in this orthogonal subspace where the noise, the the transformation of the noise lies, I'm not going to I'm not going to be too affected by it. So yes, in that case, you know, you clearly do have to search for that direction. Um, in order to see uh, the the huge change you see in the um, you know corresponding to these adversarial adversarial examples, um, you know what that what that says about the analogous uh, deep learning case. I mean, you know, maybe the deep learning case is something something similar where we're in a function space and we really do have a similar linear linear situation. You know, that would be um, uh, uh, that's one possibility, I guess. Okay, so um, let me switch gears uh, a little into uh, this interpolation versus extrapolation uh, yeah. discussion, which I noticed you didn't really. Uh, I, I paused for at good, that for, for, yeah. good, for good reason, but uh, uh, right. and I, I'm probably with you on that point, but I might as well uh, um, pin you down and you know, what you think, um, you know, do you think there's value in that discussion and uh, just be direct? And uh, do you think uh, benign overfitting uh, says, you know, it, it says anything about this and is it somehow only occurring in this interpolating regime? Yeah, I mean, the notion there of interpolation and extrapolation, at least as it's been used in that conversation, is all about, um, you know, I would say it's kind of like a, a low dimensional non-parametric sort of intuition, right, where where there's some, uh, some uh, uh, let's say, prediction rule you'd like to discover, some mapping from inputs to outputs, and, and you know, your... your um, uh, able to do well with a non let's say a local method like nearest neighbor or something because you know you've seen data in the neighborhood of the of the test point that you're you're interested in evaluating um, you know the sort of situations we're talking about here are really very high dimensional situations you have to be in um, in a high dimensional space and in some sense uh, you know that that kind of intuition um, uh, really doesn't apply um, and, uh, you know, in the, in the linear case we look at, um, uh, it's really, you know, there is this, this low domain for, for things to work. There's, there's this, uh, simple low dimensional piece, um, uh, where everything's going on and everything else you can view as extrapolation, if you like, right. That, that, you know, you're fitting, fitting to noise in this very high dimensional way, because, you know, everything is, uh, uh, in some sense, in a direction that's orthogonal, you know, far in that sense, um, a direction that's orthogonal from everything interesting. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that that sort of, um, uh, that sort of conversation has much to, 
that, that I can add much to that conversation. Let's let's put it that way with uh, with with this sort of uh, um, uh, study of this sort of phenomenon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fair, fair enough. I'm um, uh, okay. So maybe uh, in the last couple of minutes, I want to uh, shift um, maybe to some some of my own uh, my own question with regards to implications where we you know suppose we want to start looking at some real nonlinear effects because uh, like you i i'm all on board for understanding the simpler models especially when uh, they line up with the nonlinear cases uh, but you know one of the cases um you know, one of the reasons these things are so successful is distribution shift. And this is also getting away from the NTK regime that uh, oftentimes when there's distribution shift, uh, it works very well. And on top of that, it's not just distribution shift that, you know, we can take the top layer of the network and train it on other problems that work. So this is really more than just distribution shift. This is showing that there's some kind of stability in the representation uh, that's being uh, that's being learned because we can always kind of say yes, there's the same target function in different domains, but the representational question is, is very different because when we strip off the top layer, we can use it on other problems where the target function is is truly different. And if we kind of go back to some of your earlier insights, because you know you started with some of the history here, uh, what um, you know what are your insights for? Um, kind of this mix of both stability, because even if it isn't kind of transferring well, often I'm just observing these representations, they seem kind of stable. Uh, and, you know, how do you think about that with regards to, uh, to, uh, to generalization, sorry, to, to, to uh, uh, um, transfer learning, not, not, not distribution shift. To transfer learning, yeah. Well, basically, uh, we, we just have another problem and we just, you know, take the, the top layer of the network and apply it. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been, I, I mean, I, I guess it's a, it's a similar vintage to some of the, some of the work I, I described early on when I was, uh, uh, that, that I mentioned about, um, you know, some of these uh, earlier uh, NeurIPS um, papers. Um, there's been a bunch of work on on uh, trying to formalize this question of uh, transfer learning, representation learning, uh, if you like, and and there, um, you know, there's sort of an easy an easy way to think of these as uh, you 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 have a uh, a set of of learning tasks, and you you can learn from multiple tasks to uh, come up with a representation that you need to have in common across these tasks. And, and you know, that's, that's a way that you could learn a common representation that, you know, uh, uh, is then useful on subsequent tasks. It's sort of a meta level view of, of the usual um, uh, view of generalization. You know, I have a, a sample of tasks and I generalize from those tasks to my new task as yet unseen on which I can predict something something well. So that, you know, I think, uh, I mean, things become a little more abstract when you view things in that, at that sort of meta level, but really conceptually, it's no different from the classical kinds of questions we've, we've asked forever in, in, in understanding generalization. Um, what I think is really fascinating with some of the deep learning practice in that area is, you know, there's no, there's no sample, there's no meta level sample. It's one task, you know, you have, let's say image net and, uh, uh, and on that, uh, um, uh, on that problem, a representation gets learned that's then useful for all sorts of other things. Um, you know, I mean, perhaps, perhaps um, what's interesting there is that the task is complex enough that, um, you know, perhaps you're getting, you're getting something similar to this uh, sample sampling of different tasks, because, you know, it's a, it's a classification problem, but it's uh, there. There are so many labels that uh, you know this is this is providing um, uh, sufficiently rich information to learn learn a representation. Um, you know what what's going on there? Why that's why that suffices um, uh, for a set of, of uh, for, for that sort of meta level learning problem. I think is is really fascinating. I think that's a really interesting direction. Um, um, yeah, but as, as I say, you know, it's not. It's not. It's not even clear, you know, how to 
so so one thing that's really interesting there is you know what what suffices how do, how do you know that that um uh, a problem like ImageNet is going to be good enough to be so transferable across uh across other tasks it's very different from the usual uh sorts of you know the intuition we have from the lower level learning problems that you're sampling you have a bunch of independence you really don't here right there's there's, there's not that independence across different tasks um, so I, you know, I, I, I think that's a very, very interesting direction. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I think we're essentially out of time. So I'd like to thank Peter again for giving a, a great talk, and you know, just for uh, a lot of the, his great work over the years. So it was a pleasure to uh, have him speak. So thanks again, Peter. Thanks a lot, Sean. Thanks all. <laughs>